it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Dell S2722QC. The OSD is controlled by pressable buttons on the right side of the bottom bezel facing downwards. There's also a power LED and a power button there, and that power LED glows white when the monitor is on and blinks white when it's on standby, so it enters the low power state. Alternatively, you can disable that power LED when the monitor's on in the OSD. If you press one of the buttons, other than the power button, you get this little quick menu, so labels are displayed on the screen. The first two buttons there, they're shortcut keys, and you can configure them in the main menu system. So you press that third button to get into the main menu, and the fourth button there is exit, it's always exit. You'll see that the remaining buttons are now directional, and they're again quite clearly labelled on the screen, so you know what they're going to be doing. If you go to personalise, you can see the shortcut keys there. Shortcut key 1, which is your first key, shortcut key 2, which is your second key. You can change them to preset modes, or you can actually have it so it will select a specific preset mode for you. So show all modes will mean you're selecting them. It just brings up your preset menu and you can cycle through them. Alternatively, you can select a specific preset if you like to quickly use that. And you can do the same with shortcut key 2. So at the moment, I've just got mine set to preset mode. So if I press that again, you can see you can cycle through the preset modes and easily select one. The second key there, if I press that again, I can quickly change the brightness or the contrast. And brightness and contrast, that is the first thing you would change in the main menu system as well. That's the first section. You can see it's laid out in Dell's usual modern style. It's then input source. You can select the input used by the monitor. You can have it automatically select the input for you. Sometimes you might have some issues if it's trying to automatically select the input. It might not come to life as quickly as you might expect. I mean, there can be various reasons for that, not just for this monitor, but just more generally. But do try and have auto source disabled. If you're having issues with that, it might just help you. You can have auto select behavior change for USB-C. So it will prompt you if you've got multiple things connected to the monitor, or you can have it automatically select for USB-C or not. And again, have a play around with this if you are having issues with the signal. By issues with the signal, I mean you might have to turn the monitor off then on again as well to get an image to be displayed. There can be various reasons for this, various power saving and other signal issues that aren't specific to this monitor, but just thought I'd make you aware of them. Reset input source, that will reset this part of the menu to the factory defaults. There's then color preset modes, standards the factory default. There's comfort view, which is a low blue light setting. That gives you a warmer look to the image. It greatly reduces the blue light. And I explore this more in the review. It is an effective low blue light setting. I'll just change my background so it's a little bit clearer what kind of changes these settings make although you can't really see them properly in the video. Movie that upsets the white balance and also creates some oversaturation and messes up the gamma. Basically, all of these settings make changes to gamma and color balance, which can't be corrected in the OSD. I don't like them for that reason, but it's the same reason I wouldn't generally like presets on monitors. I'm not specifically criticizing these presets only. FPS, that lightens things up, makes changes to gamma to increase visibility. It gives things quite a washed out look in some respects, but creates some oversaturation elsewhere. Not a very nice look, but again, if it works for you, then fine, use it. RTS gives a more cinematic look, really, quite punchy, quite vibrant, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, again, have a play with that. RPG, that sort of selectively oversaturates some other things, makes further changes to gamma. Warm is just like a low blue light setting. Actually, I should really mention RPG is probably the, the best balanced of the other presets. And one reason you might like to use these presets rather than standard or custom color, which I'll come on to shortly, is that they also allow you to adjust the hue and saturation. So that isn't something which the standard mode, for example, would give you access to. So do be aware of that. And the RPG setting, and I believe some of the others, I was sitting a bit far from the screen when I was talking about them, so I couldn't really see this so clearly, but there seems to be a sharpness filter as well that's applied. Yeah, it's definitely applied with the FPS, RTS, and RPG movie, perhaps a milder sharpness filter. The warm setting, that's just like a mild low blue light setting. Cool, which gives you a high white point. And there's custom color, and that's the one that lets you change the red, green, and blue color channels manually. Next, there's input color format. RGB is the one you're going to be using for most systems. If you're using a YCBCR signal or you want to be using that, then that's what you select. 
but if you find that the image goes really green and weird looking, it's probably because you've got this selected and you should have RGB selected. Reset color, which will reset this particular part of the menu to the factory defaults. Also be aware of this preset system, as I mentioned in the review. The brightness is controlled universally, so it applies to all presets. So if you make changes to the brightness or contrast here, or if you make changes in display, such as let's say you change the response time setting, that applies universally as well. So it's not specific to the different presets. The other thing to be aware of is that HDMI and USB-C or DisplayPort Alt mode, they will save your setting independently as well. So if you make changes to brightness or contrast, for example, and you're connected with HDMI, if you then connect via USB-C or using a DisplayPort signal, you'd have to make those changes again. Next, you've got display as aspect ratio. So a few different settings here. So the 16 by nine, and that will maintain a 16 by nine aspect ratio regardless of your source resolution. And that means it will use all pixels of the monitor using an interpolation process. And that is explored in the written review in the interpolation and upscaling section. Next is auto resize. And I've also switched over to the full HD resolution. So it's not running the native resolution anymore. So it'll be a bit clearer what some of these do, but auto resize that will look at the aspect ratio of the source resolution and stick to that, but it will fill out as many of the pixels as it can without stretching the image and messing up the aspect ratio. So you will have a black border depending on your resolution, but because this is a 16 by nine resolution I'm running at the moment, there aren't any black borders, but I'll just switch over to a 16 by 10 resolution. And you'll see now there's a black border at the side. So that's the edge of the screen where my fingers are now. It's a black border around the image, but only at the sides, not above and below. Back to the full HD resolution now, a four by three, that enforces a four by three aspect ratio, regardless of your source resolution. So you can see it's all crushed together and there's black borders at either side of the image. And next you've got one-to-one -one. that will just use the pixels called for in the source resolution and it will use a black border for the rest of the pixels. So I've got an undistorted full HD image in the middle of the screen there. Next, you've got a sharpness control. You change that in increments of 10%. 50 is the default. That's a good neutral sharpness level. You can make it sharper or less sharp, depending on your preferences. You might like to change this if you're running a non-native resolution, for example. You might like to sharpen things up a little bit. Response time settings explored in the review, normal, fast, and extreme. USB-C prioritization. This is a bit of a weird one. It's labeled a bit strangely, but it explains in the manual that really you want to select high data speed if you want to be using a DisplayPort 1.4 signal. Whereas if you're using an older version of DisplayPort, you want to use an older version of DisplayPort, you'd select high resolution. I know that's very confusing how it's labeled. So for most modern systems, try selecting high data speed for the highest level of capability. Next up, you have Dark Stabilizer, which is why I've got Legom, legom.nl, the website in their black levels tests open in the background. So this is a low-end gamma enhancement, which will lighten up some dark shades so that they're brighter and more visible. You'll see the dark blocks change, the visibility of those change as I increase this. It's actually fairly granular, it works quite well. It doesn't affect the brighter shades and it doesn't affect pure black, so it doesn't affect your contrast. It just really targets those darker shades. So if you want a competitive advantage in your game, making people easy to spot in dark areas, for example, then you might want to increase this a bit. That's the kind of thing this can be used for. Next, there is Smart HDR, and by default, this will be set to off, but if you select one of the others, Desktop, Movie HDR, or Game HDR, the monitor will respond to an HDR color signal when one is detected. These don't have any effect if you're just running with an SDR signal, as I am now, but if I switch over to HDR, so I use an HDR signal, I've just turned HDR on in Windows, you'll notice that it says HDR plus, I'm not sure what the plus is for, it just means it's running HDR, it's got an HDR signal. You might also notice there's a little bit of a sort of ghostly look around some of the white text on the OSD here. You can't see that to the eye, it's just the camera, it's just the high brightness is creating that effect at the moment. You can change the smart HDR setting, and these are explored in the review, the effect they have. So desktop's the best balance, the other ones apply various different filters as well, but you can't change the preset mode. If you try, it just tells you currently processing HDR content, basically just saying you can't select a preset mode under HDR. And also you'll notice that your brightness is locked out as well. And it's not locked at 60%. That's just what was selected before. It's locked at full brightness, basically. 
and the Zen Reset display, which resets this display section of the menu to the factory defaults. You've then got PIP, P by P, picture and picture, picture by picture. Various different settings here. This isn't going to be too exciting because I've only got one thing connected to the monitor at the moment, one source, but you can see there's a box towards the top right at the moment. I'll just get the camera a little bit further away so you can see that better. So you can see when this is active, there are various different settings. You can change the, well, you can change the size of that to a large box if you prefer. You can change the subsource, so that's the source, your secondary source, in other words, used for that black box there, HDMI 1, HDMI 2, or USB-C. USB-C is greyed out because that's what I'm using for my primary source at the moment. You can change the location of that box or the secondary source, the subsource. You can select it so the main or the subsource is used for audio. Video swap, which will change the sub and primary sources. And you can change the contrast of the subsource independently. There's also P by P, picture by picture, which will just put your primary and subsource next to each other on the screen. You can see it does it there without distortion. If you have your resolution set up differently, you could use more of the screen space. It's just because I'm using the native resolution at the moment and it's trying not to stretch things out and mess up the aspect ratio, that kind of thing. It could use more of the screen space depending on the resolution of your picture by picture sources. I think most people are probably going to be wanting to use picture in picture because it will help maximize the screen space with a greater range of resolutions. You've then got audio that allows you to change the volume of anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack or the integrated speakers. You can enable or disable those integrated speakers. And you can reset this little part of the menu to the factory defaults. Next you've got menu, so there are various different settings related to the menu itself, such as the language it's displayed in, a transparency effect, you can increase or decrease the transparency level, or disable the transparency effect completely. This is the idle timeout period, how long after the last button press before the menu will automatically disappear. You can just press that back button a few times to get rid of the menu on your own terms. There's lock, and you can have it so it locks the menu button, the power button, or both the menu and power buttons. I do like to go through this because I know sometimes people accidentally have their monitor locked. It did say to look at the user guide if that happens or for information about how to unlock it. So now if I try and press the power button or any other button, it just gives me this padlock. So it's saying it's locked, I can't do anything. What you have to do is you have to hold the fourth button, which is the button next to the power button for four seconds. And then select option. <laughs> that was a bit cryptic, I haven't seen that before. Uh, so I'll just get that back, sorry. You just press the first one there, which unlocks it. I'm not sure exactly what the second option there was going to do, but I uh, haven't explored that before. But now I've unlocked the menu system. If I then hold that fourth button again for four seconds, you can then select your lock option. So you don't necessarily have to go into the menu system if you don't want to, to lock the OSD. Just something I learnt by reading the user guide, who'd have thought that could be useful. And reset menu, which will reset this section of the OSD to the factory defaults. There's personalised shortcut keys, which I've been through. Power button LED, so that little LED there, that little white thing, the bottom right of the video, you can probably just barely see. If that's annoying you, you can turn it off. There are different USB-C charging modes, so you can have it so it's on in off mode or off in off mode. So when you've got the monitor switched off, if you want to be using the USB-C port to charge, you can do that. You'll notice it has a little eco leaf next to it for off in off mode, and that's the default setting as well. That's because it will draw less power. Even if you're not using the USB, it will draw slightly less standby power if you have this set to off in off mode. So it's just a little, you know, it's just a, a sort of a fraction for what difference it'll make, but every little does help. Other USB charging, so that does the same for the other USB ports, not the USB-C ports specifically. So the USB type A ports. And reset personalization, which will reset this part of the menu to the factory defaults. We've then got others. This has a little display info section. Most useful thing here, I mean, it gives you lots of information, um, and if you're interested in that, that's great. It shows you the different versions of things supported and currently being used as well, and gives you the current resolution, so that can be useful. So if you've got a non-native resolution selected and it displays that there, then it means the monitor is using scaling interpolation. If instead it's displaying 3840 by 2160, it means it's your GPU or system handling the scaling, so be aware of that. 
the refresh rate there, that will also change in a variable refresh rate environment, so it will give you an indication that the VRR technology is working. If your content's running between 40 and 60 frames a second, that will be fluctuating. DDC slash CI, part of the plug and play functionality that allows you to use software to control the monitor, such as Dell's Display Manager software, which I'll show you shortly. LCD conditioning, as it said here, this feature is designed to reduce minor cases of image retention. I didn't have any such issues with the monitor in my testing anyway, but this is something which they typically add to Dell monitors. And it will just cycle various different colors or various different shades until you press a button to terminate the cycle. And this is just designed to get rid of any mild image retention that there might be. Again, don't expect to have this. And this is a standard feature on Dell monitors. That isn't to say it has them on all Dell monitors, but on quite a few I've used, it does have this feature. You can see the firmware version, the service tag, reset others, which will just reset all of these settings to the factory default. So basically just reset your DDC slash CI to on. I don't know what else it would do. So yeah, that's quite limited there, but that's what it does. And factory reset, which will reset everything to the factory defaults. So Dell's display manager software then, I'll show you that now. It's going to be downloaded in the link given in the video description. You don't need USB connected to the monitor. This uses DDC slash CI. I'm going to have to change the exposure so you can actually see this. So when you open it up, it gives you this little quick menu here. I'm sorry it's very small. It's because of the resolution I'm using without any scaling. It is very readable. I mean, to me, it's perfectly readable, but in the video, it might not be so readable. So there you go. I've put 150% scaling on just so this is bigger for the sake of the video. And you can see that there is the ability to change the brightness and contrast recently used. So these are different window arrangement types you can have, and you can explore them in more detail by clicking more options. So you can change the resolution here. That will just open up your display settings there, allow you to change the resolution. You can also change the preset. Or if you press configure or select auto mode, it means you can have different presets for different applications, if you like. Next is easy arrange. So that was the thing that was shown at the bottom with recently used. Different arrangements for windows, different ways to sort of snap your windows to different positions on the screen. I actually quite like Dell's implementation of this. And also be aware, if you want to access the display manager quickly, you can just get it from the system tray there and click on it. So then it will open back up. So I've got two windows open and I can snap them into position. They're already in this position, but snap them back in. So they're side by side now. And now when I go back on display manager, you can just press other things to arrange these windows differently. And I like the way it does this instead of you having to drag them again. So once you've dragged them once, it remembers their position and it will rearrange them very readily. There's an input manager and that allows you to rename the input so you know which system everything's connected to or that kind of thing. PIP mode so you can select your picture and picture, picture by picture settings. And if you click one of these, further settings will be displayed here. I'm not going to do that just because I haven't got two sources selected. I've already been through all of that anyway, but this is just another way of activating and changing those settings. You can also assign different inputs to shortcut keys. So if I pressed Control Alt and A, for example, it doesn't have to be Control Alt and A, it's Control Alt and something else as well. Then it can switch to HDMI or it can have, let's say, Control Alt and S that would change to USB-C. In fact, that, that looks like it will switch between USB-C and HDMI. So if you frequently switch inputs and you want to be able to do this with your keyboard instead, that just makes that easy. If you've exited Display Manager, as long as it's still running in the background, it's in my system tray here, that's fine. It will still respond to your shortcuts. You've then got options, power nap options, so that will that is some power saving things. Reduce the screen brightness when the screen saver activates. I haven't really played around with these, so I'm not sure exactly what they do. Um, that just seems to open the screen saver settings, it's not particularly useful. So I think these are just similar to some of the Windows power management options. It's just another way of getting to them. And the other thing here are different shortcuts. So you can have shortcuts for the program itself, including the easy arrange things. So you can, if I press Control, Shift and Home, let's see what that does. You can see it cycles between different window arrangements. So that's quite neat if you're using that. There's also one for PIP position. Dark stabilizer, if you use the dark stabilizer, 
You can have that set to, for example, Control Alt and G or Control Alt and whatever you like. Or I'm assuming Control Shift instead of Control Alt as well. You could have it. Yep. So you can just play around with that if you want, if that's something you're frequently changing. So that's really all there is to the OSD on screen display menu system of the Dell S2722QC. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.